Welcome back, everyone. I am Michael, your host for Antediluvian Revelations, a poetic retelling of the book of Enoch, the prophet. This is the sixth segment of the revised summary discussion of part two. Spoiler alert! As the title of this section implies, the remaining discussion about the identity of Melchizedek becomes a spoiler with regard to the suspense of the tale in Enoch's story. Melchizedek is not the name of any particular person or entity beyond it being the name of the king of Salem in the time of Abraham. Melchizedek is a term referring to the function of an entity whose purpose is to serve in the court of Almighty God on the Day of Judgment. The Day of Judgment for mankind will occur in the 120th Jubilee year. As defined by interpretation of Genesis chapter 6 verse 3, the Day of Man will be a hundred and twenty years. The calculation of when the 120th Jubilee year will occur is so complex that Albert Einstein would consider it challenging. For this reason the author will not discuss this matter further and he is not a mathematician like Albert Einstein. Removing Melchizedek from the text of religious documents may have the effect of removing the curse but there is no guarantee that such an action will solve all of that book's problems. By clearly stating here and with no confusion that the fraudulently created character of Melchizedek is the source of a curse upon a religious text associated with Judaism and Christianity, this book has protection against that curse. It might not be practical to rip out the pages referencing Melchizedek from every copy of the Holy Bible or Book of Mormon existing on the planet but a reader may choose to do so for his or her own personal copy. The inclusion of Melchizedek in the text of the Holy Bible is completely heretical and has no valid purpose other than to create the curse of confusion in what would otherwise be a sacred document. A Melchizedek is an angel whom God assigns to be the angel of peace, but the name is a metaphorical reference to the king of Salem, who brokered a peace between Abraham and the king of Sodom. Solving the extended curse of mistaken identity leads to a greater understanding of the true identity of the Messiah, and rejecting Melchizedek as a false identity fraudulently injected into the text about the message of Christ has been the key component in the author's ability to solve the secret message hidden within the third parable. The author came to know the truth about Melchizedek before reading the book of Enoch the prophet and that knowledge enabled a further understanding of how the inclusion of Melchizedek in the Holy Bible, the Slavonic translation, and the Book of Mormon is the source of an ancient curse on those texts that does not appear in the Quran. More Antediluvian Revelations A few other relevant Antediluvian Revelations appearing in the fourth canto are the predictions of refrigeration, mankind's development of viruses as weapons, the creation of radioactive isotopes that contaminate the entire planet, and nuclear winter resulting from the use of nuclear weapons in global warfare. These prophecies come from a spiritual source whom Enoch does not specifically identify in the translated text, the same as he identifies the source of other information. The poetic retelling of the story in this segment attributes the prophetic words to Fanwell. Ordinarily, it would have been Michael's characteristic to foretell of humanity's current situation with plagues caused by the accidental release of bioweapons, radioactive fallout from nuclear power plant disasters, and nuclear weapons usage becoming the real destruction of the Earth's environment. Fossil fuel usage is the least concerning environmentally destructive contamination at present. Radioactive fallout in the form of cesium-137 resulting from global thermonuclear warfare is much deadlier than carbon monoxide polluted air. Both atmospheric contaminants are killers. It might seem unlikely that Fenwell would be telling these things to Enoch. However, it appears as though Enoch may have been conversing with all of these archangels who would have equally been able to provide him the information for his prophecies. The poetic retelling of Enoch's conversation with Fenwell is an example of how the spell of confused identity has been further broken by the addition of missing information. The early English translation may have intentionally concealed the identity of Fanuel because the Catholic who translated the ancient Ethiopic text would have denied there was a fourth archangel named Fanuel. He would have also been excommunicated for disagreeing with established doctrine 
that had claimed there were only the three archangels. If Sir Lawrence did not intentionally conceal the identity of Fanwell, then the scribe who copied the text in Ethiopic may have created this spell as a component of the original curse. The identity of Fanwell as one of the four archangel paths has been previously lost to mankind for thousands of years. The breaking of the curse has also enabled the world to finally know Fanwell, and that his task has been to tell mankind to repent in the hope of everlasting life. It makes perfect sense that Fanwell would be the one telling these future events of plagues, wars, and pestilence because these horrors are the punishments mankind will face without repentance. Without truthful repentance through baptism in water and in the name of Yahweh, there can be no forgiveness and everlasting life. And this act of concealing the truth about the four archangel paths further obfuscated the message of Jesus Christ, who walked the path of Fanwell even unto death. Jesus was baptized by Elijah, who was known to him at that time by the name John the Baptist, and Elijah baptized Jesus in the name of Yahweh. Baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is a blasphemy, because God is only one entity, and the name of God is Yahweh. It has been the author's vision in a dream with Jesus revealing to him this specific concern about Cesium 137, during the creation of this poetical work, which also resulted in an understanding that this unknown archangel was Fanwell. It was Jesus Christ who has walked the path of angels and mastered the characteristics of Raphael, Michael, and Fanwell while on earth. The mystery of this archangel in Enoch's prophecy is the secret that has been kept from all of humanity by the pagan idolaters who have endeavored to conceal this truth from mankind. Jesus Christ died delivering the message of repentance and the hope of everlasting life because that was the path of Fanwell. Christ mastered the path of Fanwell even unto death as God decreed. But Jesus was not a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin because that is the premise of paganism. Mankind will be punished for the murder of God's chosen one who was a human emissary of peace like the ancient king of Salem named Melchizedek. The period of time God has allowed for repentance has nearly come to its end, and the prophesied signs warning about the coming of the apocalyptic day of judgment are occurring every day. There are also the antediluvian revelations of how those who insist that Jesus was Son of God and born of a virgin will be rejected by Yahweh on the day of the great judgment. The errant theological doctrines based on Roman Catholicism have insulted God, by insinuating that an eternal supreme being must impregnate a human female the same as Zeus or Apollo, who were false gods of pagan mythology. Christian denominations that follow a doctrine of son of God and born of virgin are pagan theologies, no different from Greek, Roman, and Sumerian mythologies. The English translation of Enoch's prophecy from the Ethiopic says that the son of woman believers will perish when God rejects them for their blasphemy. Christians blaspheme God by teaching a theology that is actually polytheistic paganism, and the one true God is only one entity. Judaism is monotheistic, and the advent of Jesus Christ as a human being and the Messiah who delivered the message of repentance and everlasting life did not change that fact. Jesus Christ was not God in the flesh, nor Son of God. Jesus Christ was the Messiah who delivered God's message of repentance and the hope for everlasting life. The previous statement is the core premise of God's eternal truth prophecy, which is the only salvation for the souls of mankind. All oppositional arguments referencing any of the texts in the New Testament or support of any refutation of this truth are invalid because the ideology of inerrancy is a fraud. The Holy Bible, and particularly the New Testament, is a cursed book filled with fraudulence resulting from pagan editorialization occurring within the first 300 to 400 years after pagan Romans and heretic Jews murdered the Messiah, the true prophet of Almighty God. The name of the Chosen One was Yeshua. The Real Purpose for Transfiguration The fifth canto in this second part has several antediluvian revelations. This portion begins with the introduction of the son of Lamech, where this character rightfully should appear. 
In the Ethiopic manuscript and early English translations, the son of Lamech initially appears in chapter 10. But this material does not belong in that location. In fact, this was one of the author's first discoveries of how the translated text was clearly out of sequence because of a curse placed upon the ancient manuscript. Breaking that curse in the poetic retelling finds the introduction of Noah more relevantly occurring later in the story sequence than it appears in the early English translations. Noah's appearance in this parable also confirms that Enoch had to return to Earth during Noah's lifetime when the ice comet approached the Earth on its slingshot trajectory from the Oort cloud. It takes some time for a chunk of ice from the outer reaches of the solar system to get to Earth. The most important revelation in this segment of the story is that God may have also transfigured Noah's spirit to be eternal before the flood, which would have enabled him to complete his mission and live an even longer life than most other human beings had ever lived in the history of mankind. The transfiguration of Noah was relatively important to ensure that he would not die before completing his mission. The transfiguration of Enoch had a similar practical requirement to ensure he did not die which kept Enoch available to prevent anything bad from happening to Noah. The transfiguration of Elijah had the practical requirement of enabling him to return to earth, becoming known as John the Baptist during the time of Jesus Christ. The transfiguration of Jesus Christ had the practical necessity of enabling him to be resurrected from the dead in order to prove the message he delivered about God's forgiveness and gift of eternal life was the truth. Because Melchizedek was the name of the ancient peacemaker king of Salem, and conceptually represented in the poetic retelling as the angel of peace, there is no provision for any argument that Melchizedek was another human being transfigured to have eternal life. The king of Salem, named Melchizedek, died, the same as all other human beings who were not transfigured to have everlasting life, and he was not one of the two witnesses to the transfiguration of Jesus. The appearance of two witnesses at the occurrence of Jesus Christ's transfiguration had the purpose of validating transfiguration as Eloi's ultimate spiritual power. The three hearsay testimonies about Christ's transfiguration appearing in the Gospels provide circumstantial evidence to correlate the early transfiguration events for Enoch, Noah, and Elijah as significant antediluvian revelations. All of these transfiguration events are documented occurrences of contact between humans and a superior extraterrestrial species that has the capability of modifying the spiritual energy of a human soul to be eternal. Transfiguration of a creature's spiritual energy to be everlasting or to end upon the death of its host is the capability that only one supreme being in the entire universe has. And Eloi is the one. The Mystery of the Two Witnesses The 11th chapter of the New Testament book of Revelation describes the appearance of two witnesses who will be killed then arise from the dead after three and a half days. When they ascend after resurrection, an earthquake will kill several thousand people. There will likely be a great deal of a debate about interpreting this passage, and it is one of the most controversial prophecies in the text. On the one hand, the two witnesses could have already appeared on earth, died, and were resurrected. Also, the two witnesses John writes about in this passage may have been the two eternally spiritual beings present at Christ's transfiguration. While the Gospels describe these two witnesses as being Elijah and Moses, the testimonies about the event are not from those who were present when it happened. Moses was not likely one of the two eternally spiritual beings because he was a murderer and did not receive everlasting life. On the other hand, the two witnesses prophesied in the Revelations may be two people who have not yet died because this event has not yet happened. Because this event is a critical turning point in the prophecy of the revelations overall, the event will signify that Judgment Day is about to commence. John's telling of this event may be the only time when he endeavored to testify about what he had seen as one of the three living witnesses to Christ's transfiguration. The two witnesses in this case are persons who are described as dying and resurrecting the same as Jesus because they were also recipients of God's gift of eternal life. Moses was never transfigured to have everlasting life. And what appears in the text may be another example of pagan editorialization to collaborately justify the changes made to the gospel testimonies of three persons who were not present to actually be witnesses to the event. The discussion of this passage does not have complete correlation to the discussion of the prophecies appearing in the book of Enoch the prophet. However, two potential witnesses other than Elijah who were previously transfigured to have 
everlasting life were Noah and Enoch. An alternate explanation of the 11th chapter in John's Revelation is that the passage describes two witnesses who will appear on earth to proclaim the truth of Eloi. The two witnesses are components of the fourth and final CE6 event for mankind, and the outcome of that event will be known as Judgment Day. According to the Little Book Prophecy, humanity fails Judgment Day, which results in the apocalyptic end of mankind. Depending upon when the reader may be reading this text, Judgment Day may have already happened, but there is no need to panic. There is really nothing anyone can do to stop the apocalypse, and it is supposed to happen. Theoretically, the CE6 event of an attempted alien intervention on Judgment Day is similar to a litmus test, which will indicate to God Almighty that humanity has failed to repent and evolve as a peaceful species. Adonai's love and mankind's hatefulness and proclivity to murder are intolerable to God. Additionally, it may be that mankind is on the verge of discovering a technology necessary for interstellar travel, and God cannot allow humanity's hatred to infect another world. God has decreed the destruction of mankind to prevent the human species from being able to spread its filthy hatred elsewhere in the universe. If this event of an attempted alien visitation designed to be an intervention has already occurred, then it may have happened as long ago as the Eisenhower administration. Of course, the possible intervention in Earth's evolution by an alien species other than the Elohim is a very plausible idea because of what occurred during the time of Enoch, who may have lived on Earth almost 6,000 years ago. Visiting aliens who purportedly attempted to communicate with Eisenhower in the 1950s may not have been the Elohim, but they may have been sent by Almighty God to warn humanity of how nuclear power was not to be used for weapons. If this did happen, then the moronic goon squad working for Eisenhower probably killed the alien visitors after concluding that they were Soviet spies. The alien bodies mysteriously disappeared because eternally spiritual beings can be resurrected and all of what happened was plausibly deniable in the absence of any remaining physical evidence to prove anything. There will never be the discovery of any evidence to corroborate this theory, but plenty of ufologists and ancient alien theorists will love reading about it. According to this theoretical explanation of the prophecy of the New Testament book of Revelation, which relates the death and resurrection of two witnesses, mankind may have already failed Judgment Day by killing the extraterrestrial visitors who were God's appointed emissaries to administer the oath of non-interference when traveling to other worlds. Or these extraterrestrial visitors will come to Earth as a final attempt to prevent global thermonuclear war, which will destroy the Earth as a living planet and terminate the entire human species. It has become a concern that there has been an earthquake in Turkey that killed several thousand people in excess of 7,000 as stated in John's prophecy. Because humanity is closely approaching that time when global thermonuclear war is most likely to occur without some kind of extraterrestrial intervention, the arrival of two extraterrestrial originating witnesses may have recently occurred or will soon occur. Earlier editions of this book also predicted additional train wrecks, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions that have happened since those editions were released as podcast readings. There will be more of the same disasters occurring in the year ahead because they are the signs being allowed by God through the Archangel Uriel, who is responsible for creating these signs in the heavens and on the earth. Based upon the prophecies in Revelation chapter 14 verses 14 through 20 and Enoch's visions of the same event, the fate of mankind is to end in catastrophically disastrous nuclear warfare that causes the earth to burn in radioactive fallout and thermonuclear detonations. The global use of thermonuclear weapons will surely cause the burning of the entire planet in an unquenchable fire. Cesium-137 is a man-made radioactive isotope, a byproduct of detonating concentrated plutonium in a fission reaction that will contaminate the Earth's air, water, and land. No living thing on the planet will survive beyond a few years, perhaps as many as seven in some cases. After the global use of nuclear weapons, unless the surviving organisms are capable of physiologically or chemically adapting to the irradiated environment that remains in the wake of nuclear warfare, 
while the physical half-life of cesium-137 is 30 years and its biological half-life is 70 days. Human exposure to the radioactive isotope created by nuclear fission has been occurring since the 1950s. As a species, mankind is already slowly dying from exposure to cesium-137, caused by several years of nuclear weapons testing by both the United States and the former Soviet Union that have contaminated the Earth's environment. Additionally, multiple nuclear reactor accidents to include Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima have released radioactive contamination to the Earth's environment, and there is no cure for the cancers and illnesses they have caused or will cause. An alternate explanation of the Little Book prophecy is that world leaders who will weigh the effects of using nuclear weapons when deciding on an approach to shorten the war in Ukraine and other conflicts will erroneously determine that past experiences with accidental releases of radioactive contamination have not been so bad because people have survived those accidents. Additionally, the idea that one bomb will not cause all that much harm becomes a greater impetus for a preemptive strike. The second beast will desire to proclaim miraculous powers by bringing lightning from the heavens to the earth when he is faced with having to accept losing his power in the world. He will not go gently into that good night, but he will go deep underground into a bunker designed to ensure his survival and the survival of selected invitees when he decides to use nuclear weapons to end a war for the second time in the history of mankind. Of course, that choice does not achieve the same result as it did in 1945. Well, that is all for this episode. Thank you for listening. I am Michael.